Dear friends and members, I would like to officially welcome you to this uh, session, the online science cafe. So you can grab your coffee, you can have <laughs> coffee while we are discussing, like friends, like uh, a community. So um, it's nice to see you here again, one more time. Every two weeks, as you know, we do these uh, online events and uh, we have many interesting events uh, planned for you. Uh, today, something about Mars 2021, Mars exploration. Uh, Kelly is going to talk to us about this. In two weeks' time, we have about meteorites. And I have many interesting events coming up. I'm going to announce them sure for um, sure, um, soon. I need to just get the confirmation that I am allowed to announce them yet. Okay. Um, so, um, Hi, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I know uh, for you, you're very busy. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, uh, Katie, can you please tell us what's going on on Mars this sure. year? Sure. Yes, I will. So. Yes, you may. I am. Don't worry. All right. So, uh, hello, everyone. For anyone who doesn't know me, uh, I'm Katie Dimitriou and uh, I'm a space scientist and uh, I've worked on uh, a few missions for ESA, the European Space Agency. Um, they were Earth observation missions. So uh, it's very exciting to be talking about similar kinds of missions that are going on on another planet. And uh, we have a big explosion of science actually happening now in 20. 21 and um, it's my pleasure to talk to you all about it. So just to recap um, uh, a little bit about Mars. Mars is very beautiful and it's bright and it's red in the sky and it's fascinated humanity from uh, the beginning of basically when people were observing and looking at their uh, the surroundings. So uh, this big red object, bright, fairly bright compared to other things, fascinated them. Now we now know, of course, that it's the fourth planet from the sun and that it's terrestrial. So it's rocky and it's not, it's small. It's about half the size of the earth in diameter, uh, but it's not that small. If you took the continents of the earth, they have the same surface area as the actual planet Mars. So the actual surface that we live on the Earth is similar to that which is covered by that picture there that you see, obviously it's a sphere of Mars. Now we on Earth want to know everything about Mars and why is that? Well, out of all of the other planets in our solar system, Mars seems to be the best bet to be habitable. Okay, so it's got 38% of the gravity on Earth. Uh, so it's, it's thought that human bodies could uh, actually survive with that type of gravity without too many ill effects. It's got a really thin, okay, it's, it's got a thin atmosphere. It's thin, but it has an atmosphere. So if we were to ever go to Mars, we'd be slightly protected by that atmosphere. And basically when you look at Mars, you see features on it that lead us to believe that there should have been flowing water. You see deltas, rocks that have been weathered. And um, it's very interesting that Mars essentially now is pretty dry. Uh, there are deposits of waters on the, the caps, on the ice caps of Mars, but essentially you don't see when you go with a telescope or you go with an orbiter up to Mars, you don't see flowing rivers or anything. So they were there once and where have they gone? And as we know, life originated on Earth in water. So it's fascinating to investigate Mars to see maybe if life was once on Mars or if we can find any evidence of this. So that's why we want to know everything about you, Mars. Now, this is how much we want to know everything about you. These are some of the missions that have gone to Mars. And you can see there, there's been plenty of them. Currently, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rovers 
on Mars. I can't see perseverance. Yes, I can. Yeah. So this is up. I, I took this slide yesterday from NASA and perseverance, uh, which is the latest NASA mission, latest rover is, is on there. Now in the near future, this is going to change and we're going to have one more. And that's part of my presentation today. Now, unfortunately, only about 47% of the missions to Mars are successful. Um, out of many, many missions, the, the uh, NASA missions seem to be the most successful. So they have a good tradition since the 60s of having successful missions to Mars. Other countries haven't been so successful so far, but we have a, um, a new era now where people are sharing data and people are collaborating across the globe and the success rate is increasing because of this um, this fact. Okay so once again here is another graphic showing you of in 2019 uh, what was going on. In 2020 there was a big explosion of missions and that's because of this fact. So way back in the summer of 2020 we had the Emirates planning a mission to Mars, NASA, and also the Chinese Space Agency. And they both, they all three of these uh, missions were launched in July last year. So as you can see here, HOPE, this launcher was launched from Japan. HOPE is the Emirati mission. And uh, they, they worked in conjunction with the Japanese and the Americans to actually get the first Arab interplanetary mission in space. Also the Chinese, they have uh, also launched their first mission to Mars and they've been very ambitious because they're also planning to land a rover very shortly on the surface of Mars. And then on the 30th of July, the one that has received the most coverage Mars 2020 launched Perseverance rover, an orbiter, and a mini helicopter um, from Cape Canaveral. Here you see a graphic showing you the difference between the orbits of Earth and Mars. As you can see, Earth 365 days, Mars 687 days, so it's, it's roughly double the time. So they don't line up every year, they line up every two years. So a year on Mars is almost twice as long as a year on Earth. So it and it's energetically unfavorable to launch a mission every year to Mars. So missions are launched about every 26 months. And this shows you another graphic of why you have to wait. So this is the um, Hoffman transfer. And it's a, a very favorable way to launch a probe to actually reach Mars. And as you can see, you have to do it when the planets have lined up and take into account their motion and their time periods. AT? Yep. Does that mean if I was living on Mars, I'd grow older slower? No, unfortunately, you'd grow older at the same rate. It's just that uh, every year would be a lot longer. So I, I don't well, know if, if, you, if you were born on Mars, your birthday would be like every, I don't know, if you took Mars. Every 20 days. months. Yeah. Like, like uh, how many days oh, was so it? Like, so, so I'd be younger then. Yeah, yeah, you'd be young. You'd, 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 uh, yes, you could count your... Yeah, my years, yeah. <laughs> my, my Earth years, but yeah. my Mars years. Sorry, right, sorry, yeah. carry on. Yeah, you sorry. could. Yeah, so so you hoping to be an astronaut going to Mars soon? <laughs> You're a bit late for that, I think. That depends so if you're calculating your your uh, your age biologically or mathematically. <laughs> He's calculating it mathematically, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So so basically, the I I am very impressed with this Emirati mission. Um. So it's a country of ten million. Yes, they are. They have a lot of money. Uh. Yes, they have some experience, but they have done something amazing. Um. So they've launched a probe to another planet. And it's been an absolute success so far. 
the main objective is to study Mars's weather. And this, this, actually, this actual orbiter is in a different type of orbit to all the other missions that have been sent. It's a very elliptical orbit. And that way it can study the, um, the weather over the whole of Mars. So other, the other orbiters that are going around Mars at the moment haven't got this orbit, so they can't research the weather in the same way. And here is another graphic from um, Emirates Space Agency showing you uh, how they actually launched. So July 2020, they launched at a very high speed. They went to Mars and then they got into this elliptical orbit, uh, which um, and currently they haven't actually released that they're, they're starting to actually do the science now so it's taken some time to get into the orbit and the good thing about this mission is they're sharing all their data so you can actually go to the website and you can use their data get their results so that they've um, done this uh they're not holding on to their data they are sharing it it's a co it's a cooperation between many countries uh, the indian space agency helped them as well and um it, it's just a uh, great to see. Now, this is this is how big their orbiter is. It's not very big, um, but it's very useful. And here you see some science, some engineers testing one of the instruments on it. So that's going on at, currently on Mars 2021. We have a weather satellite. So we've got Mars weather updated um, so for the whole of the world to use. And um, that orbiter has these three instruments on it. So it's got an infrared spectrometer and a high resolution camera and an ultraviolet spectrometer as well. So it's, it's looking specifically at oxygen levels, hydrogen levels, water vapor, etc. Now the second mission I want to talk about is a little bit more mysterious. So um, I researched this a lot and, and there's not really a lot out there for me to be sure about, but basically Tianwen-1 is a orbiter and a rover and it's from the Chinese Space Agency and Tianwen-1 means heavenly questions. So it's a, a mythological name um, based on a writer who was uh, questioning um, the established knowledge about uh, the, the universe a long time ago in China. And it was also launched during this window and it's reached Mars. In some time in the net, very near future, this Chinese mission, Tianwen-1, will attempt to land a rover. Again, 47% success rate. Um, I have high hopes for this one because China has recently been very successful at landing rovers on the moon. And we predict that they're using a very similar method as NASA has used two years ago. So this is the orbiter. It's huge. Look at it. So this is a picture of the orbiter when it was um, being prepared. It's a very big orbiter and um, many, many kilos with excellent cameras on it. And this is their, 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 um, their technology mission. So what they did is they uh, sent up a, a small camera that they ejected in the orbit. And so this is the orbiter taking a selfie of itself. So this is a selfie from space. So they had a, a little camera that, that they dispatched and it's taken a, a picture of the orbiter itself around Mars orbiting. And um, that was the uh, technology gimmick on this particular orbiter. So the, the, the rover itself is small and you, you, know, you start with baby steps. But it's very, very useful because it's got a radar that's going to penetrate the ground in the search, searching for water. So, so this is um, actually got an instrumentation that hasn't been used before on Mars. And so it'd be, be useful to penetrate 100 meters below the, the surface because the, one of the mysteries is where is the water? Or how did it disappear or where did it go to? So this will give us some clues. And um, this is another uh, graphic I found from uh, the Chinese Space Agency showing, showing how the rover is going to be released. So it's going to roll down these two ramps and then go about its journey on Mars. Now, 
the, the, the rovers that have been sent to Mars are sent to this area. So it lies on the equator of Mars. It's called Elysium Planitia. And it's a smooth area where we see a lot of these features where it looks like there was once water. So it's an area that we've seen and we studied with satellites and telescopes that looks like it has deltas. It looks like it has weathered rocks. And the rovers are sent there. There's also a second reason they're sent there. And that is because it's at the equator. So you can utilize uh, solar cells to generate power, which would be much more difficult if you went to the poles. And this is a picture from, uh, I think this is from Curiosity, this picture, which is a previous NASA rover that's done very well. And this shows you the, the features on this plane. So some, you see that it's flat, it's easy to land on. There's, there's lots of debris, there's rocks and uh, you can see some hills in the background. Okay, so these are the um, landing sites on this plane of uh, these particular missions, which are NASA missions. Okay, let me just pause this for a second. Now, um, again, when I'm not exactly sure how the Chinese orbit, how the Chinese are going to actually lower this orbiter, but there's evidence that they are going to use something very similar to InSight. So I'm playing you a short clip of an animation which shows how a mission two years ago, a NASA mission, successfully landed. Remember the rover is quite light, so you can use this method for something like as light as the Chinese rover. Then obviously once that's happened, so so basically it's a, a reverse thrust to slow um, the the rover down, and then the rover will be released similarly to how uh, the Chinese mission on the moon was released. So this is a picture from Chang'e for a rover which was released on on the moon, and um, so that is the Chinese mission. A very ambitious for the first time mm -hmm. that they're going to Mars. I believe that they have really high chances of success and and i'm waiting uh it, it could be you know in in a couple of weeks that they actually attempt this landing uh and it's good to have a, another successful rover on mars doing research and helping us find out all the puzzles that we have about this this planet that we're so interested in okay now the last uh, mission for 2021 that started in 2020 that I'm going to talk about is the one that has been publicized a lot okay so basically NASA again very very liberal with the information that they're sharing uh, we are updated frequently about the missions and so far everything has been an excellent success so in in 2020 the um Mars uh, Orbiter Holding Perseverance, which is the rover and Ingenuity, which is the little helicopter, left the Earth. And successfully, they have deployed both the rover and the helicopter. 
And as you can see, uh, jubilation and joy. Now, uh, I watched this live. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that quite a few of you did. And it was so exciting. And they said it was seven minutes of, of terror because they did not know, you know, that before this, so, so everything was automated. So from at one point for seven minutes, they had no idea or no confirmation that this had been successful. So this was the moment when they, they learned that uh, perseverance had landed and everything was fine. Okay, so again, uh, a big mission, the biggest rover that's ever landed on Mars. And these are the four main science objectives it has. So it has to study the rocks and landscape. Um, it's been chosen to land in Jazeera Crater, which you can see here. Um, this is a picture taken from an ESA orbiter um, that's is still operational going around Mars. It has a big astrobiology section. So it's going to determine if it was if the place it's landed is suitable for life and look for signs of ancient life itself. So it's looking for fossilized uh, cells, etc. cetera. Uh, it also has a sample caching mission. So it's going to find and collect promising samples that another mission is going to bring back to Earth. And I, I was reading the other day a lot of controversy about whether they should bring these samples back to Earth, because what if they're contaminated with something and we let lose something worse than, than COVID-19 on Earth? And so that is a very important thing. We've never got an actual pristine sample of Mars uh, on Earth. We, we have samples of Mars as meteorites that have come from Mars and fallen on Earth, but then they undergo a change because of the temperature when they enter the atmosphere. So it's very, very important to bring back these samples. I mean, um, and again, there'll be a big debate when that happens as to how they should open them. Also, Perseverance has um, to prepare for humans. So it's testing some technologies that are going to help sustain human present on, presence on Mars. Now, I'm going to play you a, another video. Again, it, it's three minutes, but it is it was so exciting to, to watch some of this live on February the 18th. So uh, it, it brings goosebumps when I think about it. OK, so um, can you let me know if you can see it? I don't think you can see it. It's can prepared. you? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Right, I'm just gonna go back to sharing my. S okay, so this is um, uh, basically was published two days after the touchdown, and it includes live feeds audio as it was happening. The entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicant in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter conferred. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. 
OVS valid. We have confirmation that the Lander Vision System has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. TRN safety, bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Good day, you are not here. We don't hear you. I'm mute. I know. I can unmute. Right. So, ah. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you are not sharing the screen now. Okay. I know. No, I don't want to share my screen. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, so I got carried away again with, with that. I, I, uh, I, it blew my mind uh, seeing that, that video footage, seeing how much data had been transferred and how quickly. Um, it was like something we, we've never seen before in such a mission and, and for the whole world to be able to have that, to have that honor to see it. Um, we, we have to thank NASA for that. Oh, it was amazing. Loved it. Right. So I'm um, just going to finish up soon and go back to my presentation. Right, so that maneuver was using a sky crane and what was deposited was this rover here. And so far, all of the scientific instruments are working really, really well. And I love the name of some of them, like Sherlock with, uh, he's an ultraviolet spectrometer and Watson is the camera. Um, there's also a weather station. Um, there is uh, Mask Cam Z, which most of the pictures have come from. Supercam, which is a laser micro imager. Uh, a subsurface radar as well. And MOXIE. And MOXIE is a technology demonstration to see if we can make oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide. Um, this is MOXIE here when it was being made. So this this actual uh, device is running on 300 watts. Okay, so it's basically using um, electrochemistry to take the carbon dioxide from Mars's atmosphere and separate it into oxygen and, and carbon monoxide. And to do that, they have to heat up this to 800 degrees Celsius. So it's really well insulated. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of power. So it's not going to be running very often. So they, they're going to turn it on and off and get data from it and um, see how it is going. So basically the carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere is filtered in and compressed to about the pressure of one atmosphere. And then it passes through um, a, a solid where where the electrolysis happens and it separates into the oxygen and carbon monoxide. And it's very exciting because that is current. It was operational and it works. And this is very, very good news because if you can do that, you can get oxygen, which can be used for a, as a fuel to launch any person who is on Mars off Mars. So it, it's a good demonstration of technology that is actually working. 
Now, this is another of NASA's demonstrations. So it is a little tiny helicopter that is arguably the first powered flight on another planet. And uh, the area where it first took off has now been named the Wright Brothers Airfield um, in commemoration of the Wright Brothers who did the first powered flight on Earth. And this, this, uh, this little helicopter has flown five times. And it's been a great success. And every time they fly it, they are doing something different. Uh, uh, we were waiting a long time for it to fly, a little bit longer than we hoped because they had to update the software and they had to uh, do something, but it's been overall a, a resounding success, this, this helicopter. Again, another technology demonstration that you can, you, you can fly on Mars in that thin atmosphere. And it's, it's gonna be very useful because as a scouting device is looking to go to look up cliffs because the Mars rover, Percy, cannot do this. Now, this is a picture that was made by a citizen scientist called uh, Sean Duran because all of these images are being released to the public. So Sean Duran took 62 images and stitched them together to produce this amazing picture of the rover Perseverance looking at the uh, Ingenuity helicopter. And again, so citizens can participate in scientific research in this way uh, because all of this data is being released to the public. And again, this is another picture that I, I really found fascinating. So this is a panorama. Uh, again, it's stitched from a lot of pictures, but you can zoom in to this panorama and look at this scale. That, that is 50 centimeters on the surface of Mars. We're looking at that rock and you can see that it's been weathered by the wind from that distance. So amazing, amazing uh, images and a lot of science. I mean, the, the amount of science that you can do with these pictures, uh, it, it will feed us for, for, for many years. Uh, here is another one as well, uh, showing rocks that have obviously been weathered in some way. So you can see that they're smooth and this might be evidence of having had water passing over them at some point or a, a wind or precipitation. So all of this is gonna lead us to find out what happens to Mars's possibly thick atmosphere that existed once. Now, I'm gonna end now and um, talk about the cost of pers perseverance. Right, uh, I've got the figures here. Perseverance cost $2.7 billion so far as a mission, and 2.9 with inflation. Uh, it's a lot of money. And the Planetary Society has compared it to some things that are more like normal for us. So for the Avengers that came out a couple of years ago, the global box office revenue was the same. And Google makes about the same amount of money in six days. So uh, you've got to put it in perspective. Yes, $2.7 billion is a lot of money. Um, but if you put it in perspective, it, it's not that much. And it's not actually the most expensive mission that there's ever been either. Um, the helicopter, again, it was $80 million to actually launch and five million ops cost which is like a it's not that much um now we are having a new space race i believe for mars um china is on the case india is on the case and there are more missions planned for the future so it's really exciting we we, we are going to get samples uh, a mission is going to collect these samples, we can analyze them, and we've got all these this lovely data that is being generated. And um, it's very exciting for the future of Mars exploration. Maybe in our lifetime, we'll, we'll, we'll see the first humans land on Mars, and the groundwork will be done by these rovers and these orbiters that are actually gathering data and doing their research now. So, Thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, are there any questions about anything? 
Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. I'm really impressed with the comparison, the correlation between the uh, the Avengers uh, <laughs> money collected and or or costs or the uh, Google earnings with, within six days. It's really impressive, and it's also really impressive that we've flown for the first time uh, a helicopter on our planet, another planet that we know that it's being uh, conquered by dust devils, thank God touch wood, has not been affected. And uh, I would like to mention here that it was a Greek guy who flew, um, who controlled the ingenuity. A Greek guy who was living in the States. And uh, we had the chance to uh, have him online with um, a colleague from uh, Greece two weeks, or one week before the, the first flight. He was on a um, uh, on an online uh, session as well, so it, it was a pleasure to meet him. Uh, as you said, I'm also uh, intrigued of the new Mars space race, mm -hmm. and uh, what I worry about is that they, especially the Chinese. And, and the Americans, they keep a lot of things secret. <laughs> so, and uh, we also have the skeptics, the, the, um, th those people who are uh, uh, trying to analyze the images and they say, ah, oh, this uh, a, uh, uh, a spacecraft was crashed on Mars so many years ago. We see some shapes that they look like uh, pyramids. And, you know, we have these uh, funny things as well. But at for now, they're funny. Who knows? <laughs> I know, but the new resolution of these images that we're seeing, you, it's obvious that they're from weathering. It's obvious yeah. that they're from physical processes, you, you know? Uh... Yeah, Jim, you have a question? Jim Wiggins has a question. You want to... Yeah, I was... I was... That was amazing video of the landing process. Yeah. And I kept thinking as it was descending and getting closer and closer to the surface, what is controlling it? I mean, you saw that there were places where it probably should not try to land, um, hills and rocks and so on and craters and things. And they were discussing a subsystem and I've forgotten the name um, that they used, but they said it was turned on at one point and then at another point it was finished and I'm just curious if you know uh, whether this sort of the landing process was under control of some kind of um, an algorithm or I mean it couldn't have been under control of of anybody on earth because of the light time distance. No it was automatically controlled mm -hmm. and it was analyzing the terrain I remember yeah. they were talking about it. It was it was AI so uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I actually have met um, a, a, a professor at Caltech who works for JPL who was uh, doing the original um, AI for, for previous missions and he's now working on the Google smart cars. So okay. uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, 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 um, it's very, it was amazing. It was amazing the decision making processes that were going on and they weren't controlled by anyone. Yeah, no, I mean, the actual. Yeah, the the engineers must have just been sitting there watching it and just praying that it did the right <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, uh, Jim, did you do the same when you sent when you was working at JPL? You did the same with your missions, or you? <laughs> well, how is no, your I was... How is your experience with the mission you sent uh, um, uh, when you worked at JPL? My experience with missions was with the Voyager 1 and 2 yes. spacecraft. Um, and when I was at JPL, they had already passed the um, encounters with Jupiter and Saturn. And we were keeping in contact with them. So we were still um, doing a little bit of science. But um, mostly I was working on the communications with those. So there was nothing you know, happening very fast. Uh, you had to react to with AI or anything like that. You know, it was it was more uh, the science of how to take such a weak 
such an extremely weak radio signal and try and get the most science out of it that you possibly can. A lot, and, of, a lot of bandpass filtering. Huh? A lot of bandpass filters to, to clear the noise. Oh yeah, all sorts of interesting things were going on. We were building the first digital, all digital um, component for decoding the, the symbols that come in. So you've got, you've got your carrier frequency, it gets modulated down um, and you've got side bands and they get, they get decoded. And at some point you get ones and zeros, right? Yes. Or you have to turn this radio signal into ones and zeros. And after that, it's a digital Mortation. stream. And that's, that's, that was our piece um, up until us, it was all done with analog electronics you know, resistors and capacitors and very finely, perfectly tuned components. And we were using um, microprocessors for the first time to actually do an analog to digital conversion of the signal and then, then do everything, all the filtering and so forth in, di in the digital domain instead of analog. So that was our... Um, that's where we were doing the science, yeah, yeah. I hate this part because we you need to do a lot of to use the convolution theorem and a lot of Fourier series and transforms in there. <laughs> there was a lot of that, yes. Yes. I, I always hate <laughs> convolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had to be friendly with that. And there was um, some companies were actually building special silicon for doing that process all in silicon. And so we were testing out those. My, I see micro, uh, microchips, I see, yeah? Yeah, so fast Fourier transform microchips and things Mostly. like that. We're just, we're just coming out at that time. This is late 1980s, so. But are they actually now using technology, I mean computer technology that is the latest technology or are they using technology that they are, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago because of the cost of the weight of the, how simplified it should be? Well, it's they're using DOS as well. I mean, it, it, it's common that they use older technology just because for something like a, a mission to Mars, for example, um, they want to be absolutely certain that, that, that those components are going to work and that they're well understood and everything. They don't, they don't want to use the cutting edge stuff in no general. Windows. <laughs> no, no, it's a real, it's a real time, a special real time operating system. At least it was, you know, on the missions I, I was dealing with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just incredible what, what, what that, you know, that landing that you showed us just there. I mean, just the, all of that was controlled by computers, basically. Um, and Peter, uh, we have one yeah. more question from uh, I saw that, yeah. Uh, Please. Yes, um, so, yeah, there were uh, issues with ingenuity flying, and uh, there was a lot of studies with the blades, and basically they're, they're rotating a lot faster than, the, than a, a drone would be rotating on, on Earth. And ingenuity is exceptionally light because of the of this consideration. So you're you're not going to get much uh, upward force from the blades, and it has to be light, otherwise it wouldn't be able to take off. So again, there was a, there was a possibility that it wouldn't take off, and that's why you know everyone's really excited that it actually is working so well. The the fifth flight was actually translational; it didn't do a round trip, so it, it's gone quite far away now on the fish, uh, fifth flight and it flew for quite some time. So uh, it, it goes on, it goes, it goes hopping and um, the atmosphere is very, very thin and it is carbon dioxide rich. Uh, it's also got some methane, which is a, a bit of a worry for if, if there was you know, life on there. So it's, it's, it's a concern. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that it's done, a, as you say, a transitional uh, flight, the controls, I understand, are pre-programmed in, yeah. in ingenuity, so before even takeoff. Yeah, they, 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 you communicate it uh, with it via 
the rover or via an orbiter. So uh, uh, the, the communications network that they have for this mission is absolutely amazing. Um, this is this is what's blown my mind about this particular mission. The, the speed that they're getting such large amounts of data from Mars to Earth. Uh, so, so they have, a, they have a, a good network. And with InSight um, two years ago, uh, they actually had some CubeSats to, to, to demo and see if they could use the CubeSats as well to relay data. Uh, so yes, uh, you, the, you have to send it the, the commands, load it up basically, and then it does its thing. And CubeSat, if I'm not mistaken, is one, one, uh, one cubic uh, meter, isn't it? Yeah, about that. One by one, yeah. Yeah, so, so that was two oh, years ago. They did that uh, that technology demo. So it, it's, it's using uh, small... They left the line off with that, I remember, didn't they? They left yeah. the line off. And... Yeah, yeah. They did, yeah. Actually, the, the, um, this technology, the CubeSat technology, was introduced to... Uh, to train students in gymnasiums and lyceums in the high school, how to to get to get involved with science and uh, space exploration. So, and this technology was uh, uh, supposed to be not so advanced, but uh, very simplified for the students to work on it. But the students nowadays, it seems that they are masters. <laughs> I mean, they they are very creative. They are geniuses. They are geeks. They are geeks. So they have created something very impressive for the for the um, agencies to use. So they came back and they took this opportunity with the CubeSats and they have uh, invested on it, on this technology, and they have um, developed further. They have developed this technology further more, so they are using it as well now. What's impressive about these recent missions is the time frame. Uh, I, I'm not sure about Perseverance and the tw Mars 2020, but the Chinese, I read in a source about the Chinese mission that they started planning in 2016. And that's like so short in, in time compared to previous missions. And the, the Emirati mission, they started, they announced it in 2014 and they'd had a meeting about if they were going to do it in 2013. So the, the time that these missions are being planned and, and done is shrinking too. A lot. Well, probably they have the common core and they are building on it. Mm. I, I'm not sure if the NASA missions are quite like that. Uh, and that there's also like some debate as to whether that's going to push NASA out the market in the end. Do you remember when we were told that there's going to be the first uh, human landing on Mars? Because uh, NASA announced 2027. That's and crazy. <laughs> or Elon Musk. Was it NASA or Elon Musk who said that? Uh, I doubt it was NASA. They, I mean, the samples aren't probably going to come back until then, like I later. Know. <laughs> and I think it was even Musk that he said that uh, he was going to land somewhere on Mars of 27. But they're, they're landing people on the moon very soon. We were told this by cosmonauts, uh, the British, uh, the, uh, the Russian embassy, when I uh, gave the talk on Yuri Gangari um, in April. They, they told us that very soon, they, of course, they didn't really release uh, the date for the public yet, but very soon, I believe two or three years, something like that, we are planning to do so. We are planning to land people on, on, uh, on the moon again. We'll see. <laughs> I suppose the difference is with NASA, they, they have almost a, a committee to decide which missions go ahead, and they probably get inundated with the number of potential missions they have. Whereas if you're someone like China or the Emirates, you can be a little bit more specific and a bit more um, focused maybe on a, a particular mission. Therefore, that mission may go ahead a bit quicker. Um, uh, and yet, you know, as I said, with, with NASA, they've got so many potential missions on the go that, you know, they have to sort of kind of limit it and, and maybe they're channeling resources 
means, I don't know, they have to do it quicker themselves. Otherwise, you know, they're using up. But, uh, I, believe well, that, no. <laughs> I believe that the bureaucracy was a kind of problem. That's why they were utilizing uh, all the initiatives from Elon Musk, because the uh, Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX's, uh, um, I mean, costs are lower concern, uh, compared to NASA, if I'm not mistaken, correct me, Jim. That's why they are utilizing, um, I mean, th this company, SpaceX and Elon Musk's uh, ideas. So he, he, was, uh, he was able to deliver the same service to NASA faster and cheaper than the actual organization. Uh, this is what I read uh, uh, somewhere, I don't know, two years ago. And, uh, and actually now they are independent from the uh, Soviets, uh, from the Russians, because they can send, now they can, uh, they can use the SpaceX, uh, the shuttle, and uh, they can carry their own people directly now, not from Baikonur, but uh, from, uh, from Florida again. Mm. So they avoid the, the bureaucracy and, the, and further expenses by utilizing SpaceX. Okay, we have one more question to Katy. Would you like to read it? Uh, right. yeah, um... What's the near future plan for the rover and helicopter? The near future plan for the helicopter? I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's going to go on scouting missions. So, so that there, there, there are. You, that's why I think they they flew it. It was on the seventh of May that they flew it and landed it quite far from the rover. So that was the first time they've done that. So I think that they're just testing to see how far it can go on the battery that it has, so that it can start scouting for for good sites for the rover to go to, to maybe take some samples. Um, the, the rover only has two years of funding, I read on, uh, on the NASA site. So, so maybe its mission is gonna be extended, but it is planned to do all of this research in two years. Um, MOXIE is being turned on and off. The cameras are scanning and it's, it's looking now um, and analyzing rock samples and it's going to go en route to find the place where it's the best to take the samples that will be returned to Earth. It is. It, mm. it, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I remember where, but I heard or read somewhere uh, that the ingenuity was going to fly only for two or three times, and then they have extended the mission. Is that correct? Um, they, they, they. Uh, no, what what I heard was that it can't fly for very long, obviously, because it has to recharge. And they were expecting to get at least two or three flights, but obviously, it's working a treat now. Yes. So, so uh, again, the. I, I looked up the operational costs for um, the helicopter. It's not that much. It's five million. Um, yeah, so uh, they could probably keep it running somehow with with that. Like, I don't know. It's it's, it's like a little compared to the whole mission. So it, it's off. It, and, and you know what's good about the helicopter is it sparked the imagination of a lot of of people. Uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's been a big deal in, in, uh, in my workplace, you know, people are talking about it, kids are talking about it, and um, they, they like the fact that there's a drone on, on Mars, something that they, that, that's similar to what they have in their houses. Uh, I have to remind people here that it was a Cypriot team with Arachnobia that won the first international program during the NASA space apps, mm. and they were awarded trip to NASA uh, by developing a um, Arachno a something. Something similar. Yeah. Similar, yes. For the ISS. Mm -hmm. I think it was. We have one good news about what planetarium will go, will do soon. In June, we'll start return our summit kit and observatory. And we will make for eight, 12 years old students 
uh, talk about uh, f- every Saturday, so four, talk, four meetings I will be about wonderful planets. And uh, it is uh, for uh, obviously for educational program, but uh, the main point is here is that we research not only solar system, but there are many other planets far, far away, far beyond our sun and around surrounding. So many people know those eight planets, especially in uh, kindergarten education. Every child knows that there are eight planets. But uh, as far as I know, uh, when uh, humans become uh, gr- elder and elder and they uh, graduated the school, they know that there are eight planets still now. So that's why for young age, eight, twelve, we wanted to discuss that there are other planets like Kepler, Copernicus, and so on. So there are a lot of them. And this talk will be about how planets discover beyond solar system and what are the worlds and so on. So this will be for our new, next generation to uh, break the borders of just small world, which we name solar system. Alexander, may I share my screen as well, please? I think you may still go ahead. After okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, this is a poster for the next event. Uh, this is our friend and the colleague, uh, Mr. Tagis Hills. You, uh, I met him and actually I introduced him to the Asteroid Day, International Asteroid Day, because as the National Culture for Cyprus, I recommended summer for Chris and he was the best guy to be for uh, the National Culture for Asteroid Greece. Uh, he's also the Vice President of the International Meteorite Collection Association. He's very well educated and he's an expert in, um, in meteorites. He has, uh, with his own initiative, the so-called Aerolith collection to the CU in Athens was uh, created last year. The inauguration was last year. And uh, he's going to be our next speaker on the online science cafe next in, after two weeks on the 25th of May, same time, seven o'clock Cyprus time. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, his research about discovering some sites with uh, meteorites in Greece. Uh, actually, two lakes that he uh, suggested that they were craters. And actually, he's right. He has some good results. Uh, he's going to talk about the use of meteorites in, uh, in the ancient times, uh, about creating coins and swords, and about his museum his collection in Athens. Uh, it is really incredible. Uh, he also, he has also issued, uh, he also published a, a book with John Antono, another guy who's an expert in meteorites. We'll see some samples. And um, uh, he's also a pioneer member of the Meteorite Club. Don't miss it, two weeks time. Mr. Phil, see you on the 25th. So, uh, th- Kedi, I would like to thank you very much for this uh, great uh, opportunity to learn about the latest. Uh, um, you're the- welcome. Um, is is, is the Doug is going to be speaking in Greek or English? In English. Okay. Yes, in English. And actually, I'm trying to... Uh, I had some cr- complaints from my friend, mm. uh, Father Panaredos, a priest, that we, he's very interested in astronomy. He's one of our members. He has telescopes. He comes here. Um, so I asked him to, do, to prepare for us uh, a debate about astronomy, astrology, and, uh, and uh, uh, Christianity or uh, religion in general. And uh, he's going to prepare something in Greek and English as well. So it's, I, I, I haven't tricked him now, I, I, he's, he likes it a lot. So hopefully he's going to give us a nice speech in the near future as well. So That's good. Mm-hmm, but uh, really this uh, next coming event is uh, really impressive. 
And uh, Mr. Marius, thank you for being with us. Ευχαριστώ πολύ που είσαι μαζί μας. Can you unmute, uh, Alexander, can you unmute Mr. Marius, please? Uh, I think he may do it by himself. Mm -hmm. I, I'm asking you him. You cannot right hear now. him. Right. Can you hear me now? Ευχαριστούμε πολύ που είσαι μαζί μας. Θα χαρούμε πολύ να μοιραστείς τις δικές σας γνώσεις μαζί μας. Θέλω να είμαστε, να μοιραζόμαστε. Nino, thank you very much. It was the first time I am on, on Zoom on my phone. Can you believe that? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that is always the first time for anything. <laughs> It's been great. I look forward to the next one. Thank you for joining our team. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. So, see you in two weeks time. Bye. 7 o'clock, guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.